This is the lecture for the second part of the macromolecules unit. We will focus on a special type of macromolecule proteins, and then within proteins, we'll focus on a special kind of protein, enzymes. So you should have your enzyme facilitated notes out and ready to go. You need something to write with, and you are going to need to pause to answer questions on your notes, and you will also be pausing in certain locations to watch clips. Everything that you need is under today's lesson module in content. So let's get started. So the AKS that we will be working with we will find out what enzymes are, we will learn how enzymes work, and we will also talk about what kind of factors impact how well enzymes work or if they will work at all. As you can see from the AKS, enzymes, special proteins, that speed up chemical reactions. And the AKS specifically includes digestion as a process that enzyme speeds up. So we're gonna sort of back up to seventh grade and talk about the digestive system just so we have how that system works in the back of our minds. So our challenge question, our essential question is, how can we as biochemists explain how enzymes speed up chemical reactions? Or basically, how do enzymes work? So this will be the first time that you will be pausing the video to watch two clips. You will watch a TED Talk, How Does the Digestive System Work? And we will also then watch a clip called How Do Enzymes Work? So again, these are found in the module. If the link does not work, go to YouTube and type in TED Talk, How Does Your Digestive System Work? Or, and then followed by How Do Enzymes Work? After you watch those two clips, which will be a total of about seven minutes, come back to this lecture. Okay, all right, now that you've watched the clip and you have sort of an introduction to enzymes, we also sort of need to talk about what chemical reactions are before we can talk about the fact that chemical reactions are sped up. So a chemical reaction is a process and it's changes or transforms. Transform is just a fancy way of saying change. One set of chemicals into another. So chemical reactions have two parts. They have reactants or substrate, the things that are going into a chemical reaction. And we have products, which are the outcome, the thing that is coming out of a chemical reaction. So chemical reactions are not physical changes. They can't be something that is very easily undone. Think about if you um, made a cake. All of the ingredients that go into making a cake include eggs and flour and chocolate and oil, baking powder, whatever. If you stir it all together in a pot, you can't call that a cake, it's raw. So you bake it, you, you apply energy to it, and it is transformed into a different set of combinations and it makes the cake. If you cool down the cake, the cake does not go back to its original ingredients. You can't uncook an egg, you can't unbake a cake. So a chemical reaction uh, leads to changes that aren't easily undone. And enzymes speed up those chemical reactions. So on your notes, that's just a part of a review. On your test, you will have to identify reactants 
otherwise known as substrates, and you will have to be able to identify products. So let's get into our notes. So on this slide, you should be able to answer number one. So pause the video here and answer number one. Enzymes are also called biological catalysts. A catalyst is just something that speeds up chemical reactions. It's the same thing. It's just a different way of saying enzyme. The things about enzymes are enzymes are specific. So say you have a digestive enzyme. It only is going to work in that part of the digestive system. So you have specific enzymes that work in your mouth. You have specific enzymes that work in your stomach. You have specific enzymes that work in your small intestine, so on and so forth. These specific enzymes can be used over and over and over again. Um, and typically they're named for the reaction it's going to speed up. In a few slides, you'll have some examples that you are going to copy down, and you will see that many enzymes end with the suffix. The end of the word is A-S-E, and that is your clue that you are talking about an enzyme. <clears throat> I have a question down here. Why is speeding up chemical reactions important? So a lot of chemical reactions can occur without an enzyme but it wouldn't be very efficient. So for example, every breath that you take, you take in oxygen and you expel carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a poisonous gas. If we didn't expel it, we would suffocate from the inside out, right? And so the fact is, is that we're not very efficient breathers and there are specific enzymes within our lung tissues that help us process that carbon dioxide better and more efficiently and quicker so that we don't literally suffocate in our own poisonous gases. So there's just one example of how enzymes in our bodies are very important. Something that you will see a lot, and this is going to be number two, so pause here and go ahead and copy those three bullet points to the right of number two. The other thing that you are going to need to know, so you might want to highlight this, you're going to need to know this, this metaphor. And so you're going to need to know that the key is the substrate and the lock is the enzyme. You will also need to know on a diagram the active site and the enzyme substrate complex. So we'll get to those things, but you might want to highlight them so you know that you need to know those vocabulary words. So you often hear the lock and key model when you talk about enzymes. And this goes back to enzymes <clears throat> being related to a specific substrate, a specific reactant, and it fits like a lock and a key. So the substrate, the stuff going into the chemical reaction, is like a key, and the lock is like an enzyme. It fits only to a specific type of substrate. So let's take the lock of my classroom. So the lock of my classroom only fits my classroom key. If I tried to put my household keys into my classroom lock, it wouldn't open the door. If you tried to put your household keys into my classroom lock, it wouldn't open the door. There may be another lock that fits those keys, but the lock for my classroom door only fits the key to my classroom. So it's the same with chemical reactions. So enzymes provide a space that can sort of get the substrates together quicker and then allows the chemical reaction to work faster. I often use the example of imagine that uh, you were going out on a date and uh, it was your first date, so you were nervous, so you brought a whole bunch of friends, and the person you were dating, they brought a whole bunch of friends, and you went to a movie. So you could all sit in a row, and you could have people in between you, and you could sort of look down there and talk to your date, right? 
But if you've ever been to those theaters that have those couches that only fit two people, so you should think of that as sort of the enzyme. It provides the space for the two substrate, you and your date, to get together. And it allows you to get together quicker, if that makes sense. So the lock and key model, the enzyme just acts as a, a friendly location where the reactants can come together quicker than they usually would just by chance. Okay, so you don't have this on your notes, but this is an important little diagram. So on the back of your notes, because your notes are only three pages, so flip your notes over to the, the back page, which is blank. Only use the top half because we're going to use this space again and copy down this slide. And so I like this slide because, again, it shows you the big macromolecules, starch, proteins, and fats. And then it gives you three, four examples of enzymes, amylase, pepsin, which is found um, in the stomach, trypsin, which is found, I think, in the intestines um, that break down proteins, and lipase, which breaks down fats. So you have the big piece, and then you have the smaller monomer pieces. What's interesting about this, again, is remember we talked about the suffix ASE, which represents an enzyme. And if you look at lipase, and you think about what it breaks down, lipids, often enzymes, the back end tells you that it's a, an enzyme and the front end tells you what it's breaking down. So sometimes the enzymes sound like what they're actually breaking down. So once you have that copied down, head on back to page two of your notes. Okay, so the question is, explain how enzymes are recycled. So basically what happens you're going to see a diagram that looks a lot like this diagram in your textbook, on charts, and on your test. So be familiar with this. Be able to identify all the parts. So again, the enzyme provides a space for the substrate, the reactants, to come together. So it can go both ways. You can have one substrate, like what's in the picture here, okay, and they come, they come together as one, and the enzyme provides a space for the bond to be broken, and you get a product, and you get two different products. So one goes in, two comes out. Or you could have it in reverse. You could just turn these arrows around, basically. You could have these two, now they're going to be reactants, coming in, be bonded together and be released as a um, product. So once the enzyme releases the products, it's ready and open and available for new substrate to come in. So it's kind of like a little mini factory. As long as there's substrate available and energy, you can provide that space for those reactants to get together. So you have space above it and to the side of it. So have these four bullet points and then maybe make a note to yourself. You absolutely need to memorize this diagram along with the vocabulary. So we've talked a lot about so far how enzymes help reactants get together and they speed up chemical reactions. But what does that really mean? How do they really speed up chemical reactions? Well, it has to do with something called activation energy. So on your paper on page two, you have this same diagram. And question four says, does it take more or less energy to start a reaction using an enzyme? And then you're supposed to circle or highlight the answer. So the, the answer is it takes less time. If you're speeding up a chemical reaction, it takes less time for that chemical reaction to happen. And then the next question is, what is activation energy? Activation energy is the energy necessary to start a reaction. So write that down and then look at this graph. So we have energy <clears throat> along the y-axis and we have the progress of the reaction, so time basically, um, the reaction occurring to the x-axis. 
So with or without a catalyst, with or without the enzyme, the reaction happens. We've got reactants and we've got products. So the reaction goes forth. But look how much more energy it takes if you didn't have a enzyme. The energy level is way up here versus if it had an enzyme, you only need this smaller amount of energy in order for those reactants to be transformed into products. So basically, look at our cake reference. With a catalyst, with an enzyme, we can bake our cake faster because it takes less energy to bake the cake versus without an enzyme, it would take longer to get this much energy to start the reaction. So you should think of it like a hill. Activation energy is like a hill you have to climb in order for you to start a reaction. And the enzyme makes the hill smaller so you can do it faster. If you only had to run up half of Coal Road, you would be able to do it quicker than running all the way up Coal Road to Five Fork Trickham. This just is showing you, again, sort of picturing um, the enzyme with the substrate. So this is without it. Again, you have a higher level of energy than when you have it together. It brings it together and you can move faster. So now that we've sort of talked about how enzymes speed up reactions and make things easier, we kind of have to talk about, okay, well, is there anything that can make it slower or is there anything that can um, make the enzyme not work at all? And the answer is yes. So, we are going to pause again and watch another video. Um, we're going to watch a video about how does temperature and pH affect enzymes, um, their ability to speed up these chemical reactions. So you're going to be looking here, how do temp and pH affect enzymes? And after you watch the clip, come back to the notes. All right, so the factors that regulate enzyme activity, temperature can speed up enzyme activity, too high of a temperature can bring it to a screaming halt, and low temperatures can make it actually slow down. pH is the same thing. Outside of the pH range, it can slow it down. Way outside the range, it can make it stop. So go ahead and copy down under number five, one, temperature, and two, pH, and then come back to this slide. So if you remember physical science, you talked about temperature. Temperature is just a measurement of how fast molecules are moving. Okay, so in this example, we're talking about human enzymes and our normal body temperature is about 37 degrees Celsius. So most human enzymes work well within that range. Okay, um, you know how you feel kind of crappy when you have a fever or if you're shivering, if you're too cold. Um, so if you get a fever that spikes and it's too high for too long, um, you know, you're in danger of, of death. <clears throat> And the same thing kind of happens. Enzymes aren't living, but if you heat an enzyme up too much, it's going to denature. What does that mean? It means it will change the shape of the enzyme. And if it changes the shape of the enzyme, it can't work anymore. And I'm going to skip down to number two where it talks about pH and the same thing. Most, most enzymes in humans, is we're kind of, you know, right around the... Uh, neutral range between six and eight. Although in your stomach, you've got some pretty acidic things happening and they're a much lower pH. But most enzymes in the human body uh, operate within that neutral range. If you get too far out of it, if you have an enzyme in a pH of three outside of your stomach, it's not going to work. So here's what happens. I'm going to skip forward and then go back again. So 
take a look at the enzyme and the substrate. So the blue is the substrate and the yellow is the enzyme on the bottom and the activation site. Look how it fits like a key in a lock. If it's heated up and it denatures, denature means it changes its shape. The enzyme changes shape. Look, the key no longer fits in the lock. If I took a sledgehammer to the lock on my classroom door, I'd get fired, but before I got fired, if I took a sledgehammer to my lock, it doesn't matter that I have the key to that lock. It doesn't fit in that lock anymore because I've damaged the lock, right? So denaturing damages the enzyme, and now it doesn't fit the key anymore. The substrate can't, can't fit. So it might slow down the reaction, or it might make the reaction stop altogether. The same with pH. So let me back up for just one second so I can talk about low temperature. Low temperature is a little bit different. Um, it's not so much that the enzyme is changing shape. It's more that when you have a low temperature, molecules are moving really, really slow. And since molecules are moving slow, they have less of a chance or it's going to take them a longer time to meet up with that enzyme and push that chemical reaction uh, farther along. Okay, you'll be writing about this. You're going to be writing about denaturing and the uh, enzyme key and lock model. So let's take a look at these words in graph forms. This is the last piece of the enzyme lecture. Um, and you have multiple graphs and data on your tests. And so you need to understand a few words. So this is number three, page three, number six. So this is a temperature graph. So the question is, what is the optimum best temperature for the enzyme shown in the graph? And you just have to fill in the 37 degrees Celsius. So what you're going to do is you're going to look for the hump, right? So here's the rate of the reaction. So when the reaction is, is at its fastest is where it's at its highest in the graph. So you can see that the um, reaction is working all the way from 10 degrees, all the way sort of through 57 degrees, kind of. Uh, but then notice what happens at 60. So the optimal degree is 37. So you just basically look for the top of the hill, which shows you the rate of the reaction. So it's happening fastest here. And then you just run your finger down and find the temperature. Optimum means best. So what happens at 60 is, see now the temperature is too high. Um, and the, the enzyme has changed shape. And so the rate of the reaction, it's come to a halt. It, it can't fit in the substrate any, more, any longer. So you'll have an example of how temperature affects the rate of reaction in enzymes. The enzyme is what gets broken. And then your second example, this is number seven, and you have three different enzymes, pepsin, salva, salivary, that's your spit amylase, and alkaline, which refers to um, basic, and phosphatase. So you have three different enzymes that are found in three different locations in your body. And you have to identify the best pH for each one of these. So obviously you look for the hump and just run your finger down. So pepsin works best in around a pH of two. Salivary amylase around six, your mouth is pretty neutral. Alkaline phosphatase around nine, okay? So now what I would like you to do, make sure that you have your notes so you should have also received the Amoeba Sisters recap. Again, our question, how can we as biochemists explain how enzymes speed up chemical reactions? So you can close this presentation out and you can watch the Amoeba Sisters enzymes uh, video and fill out your Amoeba Sisters recap. And that is it. Feel free to watch this again, fast forward, rewind, find what you need.